talk about it, there's a component called as tachycardia. Tachycardia is heart rate more than 100. And of course, the QRS is also wide. So which is more than 120 milliseconds, right? So now coming to the differential diagnosis. It can be of different etiologies and of course the diagnosis can be quite a lot different as well. For example, the SVT with aberrancy, right? So even there are those supraventricular tachycardias as well, which can be due to aberrant conduction, it will seem like a white curious tachycardia. Pre-excited tachycardia, of course. A lot of times we do come across, which is called as motion artifacts. I'm going to show you all some examples as well. Similarly, they, will, they can be paced rhythms. Otherwise, of course, the, uh, one of the common uh, life-threatening arrhythmias as well, which is called as ventricular tachycardia. So the importance, so why are we trying to talk about this topic? Because a lot of times uh, there is something is called as sensitivity, sensitivity and also the specificity. However, up to 80% of the times, if you come across a wide complex tachycardia, you should keep in mind about ventricular tachycardia. Whenever in doubt, treat it as ventricular tachycardia, I would say. Of course, there are a lot of algorithms as well we will try to show. Uh, which we can try to uh, use it to make it much more specific uh, for a better diagnosis. So as I was telling you, SVT with aberrancy, what happens is a lot of times you will be seeing those arrhythmias with bundle branch block. It could be with left bundle branch block, of course, otherwise with the right bundle branch block as well. But even in those, as I, I'm going to show you some of those algorithms as well, which you should try to see. So this is one of the classical examples the patient was having an accessory pathway mediated tachycardia. Uh, this was during one of the EP studies. And then you can see what do we see over here is the left bundle branch block. So over here, we can try to see on the superficial cardiac ECGs, in fact. Similarly, another accessory pathway mediated tachycardia using the right bundle branch block. So the conduction is happening through the left bundle branch. So as I already said it, even those accessory pathways are there, but of course they can have a manifested uh, or otherwise concealed as well. So concealed, what happens is on the surface ECG, especially during the sinus rhythm, will not be seeing the, uh, the pre-excitation in fact. So this is what is called as a if uh, someone is having a pre-excitation and of course symptomatic. So Dr. Dina Nath already clarified to us, that is the only time when we should call it as WPW. So the clinical features has to be present, in fact. So this was another patient as well. So this is what is called as antidromic tachycardia. Antidromic AVRT, what happens is, it will be going down the accessory pathway and reverse through the normal conduction pathway. Or the orthodromic conduction is going normally down the normal conduction system and retrograde through the accessory pathway. So that's how is the classification. So there were already some of the examples which was already shown, atrial flutter with pre-excitation. So what I always, I'm trying to give so many examples, we should not uh, try to really get panic whenever we are seeing those uh, wide curious tachycardia. If we are going to um, apply some of those basic principles, most of the times I would really say, I think everyone can uh, come to a diagnosis. So this was another good case of atrial fibrillation with pre-excitation. Atrial fibrillation, why are we saying it? If you will try to look carefully at those R intervals, most of the times it is going to be irregular. Irregularly irregular. It's not just irregular, as I said it, irregularly irregular, in fact. And as I was talking about the motion artifacts, so a lot of times it happens that you do have your intern or your senior resident which will be coming and running to you, sir, there is a... Uh, emergency, a patient in the emergency, which uh, what shall we be doing seeing this uh, rhythm? So this is a typical example. I always try to tell, tell it to them that don't try to look only a single uh, lead. Always try to look at the other leads as well. If you are going to look at those other leads, try to see the patient as well. And of course the history, which we are going to talk about further. This will always give you a really good, good and deep insight as well for the patient. Is it really a motion artifact or is it something else? So a lot of times what happens is the patient is already having a pacemaker uh, a device as well. So the patient is pacemaker dependent. So even then you can see a wide curious tachycardia. So a lot of times, even during the pacing or the a lot of times non-paced, or if someone is having a, you know, uh, intraventricular dyssynchrony or advanced stages of heart failure as well, those patients can be having a wide curious uh, with tachycardia as well. 
So now coming to the ventricular tachycardia. Ventricular tachycardia can be of different types. Different types on the basis of etiology, it can be defined into idiopathic or non-idiopathic. The idiopathic, the most common types are the RVOT, left ventricular outflow tract, or even the fascicular ventricular tachycardia. And now the non-idiopathic can be of further types as well. On the basis of etiology, it can be ischemic, VT, non-ischemic, the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or otherwise also called as channelopathies. Channelopathies will be dependent on the genetical mechanism. For example, for the long QTS or the Brugada syndrome. So this kind of ECG is pretty common. Uh, why are we calling it as a RVOTS? For example, if you try to look at the bundle branch morphology, this is a left bundle branch block. So that's why it is taking our origin from the right side. And then when we try to look in the inferior leads, so then we can see it over here, they all are pointing above, right? All of them are positive. So that's why it is taking origin from the outflow tract and from the right ventricular side. So same logic if you try to apply it over here as well. So we, we can see it over here. This is a left ventricular outflow tract, VT. And this is what is called as a fascicular VT. Fascicular VT, as we can see it over here, so what is happening is this is a right bundle branch block, right? And then if we will try to see about the axis, so this is what is called as a classic, uh, one is positive, two is negative. So what is left axis deviation? So that's why it is a left fascicular. And upon the morphology as well, you can classify it further into monomorphic, polymorphic, and of course a bidirectional as well. Bidirectional, what happens is each and every beat, the axis keeps on changing. And the mechanism can be also different. And on the basis of that, again, further we can classify it into re-entry, automaticity, and the triggered activity. And also, now coming to the management. So even on the basis of the drug, which can be used, we can classify them further into adenosin-sensitive. So there are some types of BT, which can be terminated even with the adenosin. Otherwise, something is called as veropamil sensitive which is called as, also called as Belhasin uh, type uh, tachycardia. Repetitive VT, these are some of the, uh, I would say, day-to-day -day examples uh, for the monomorphic VTs, non-idiopathic. So VTs, so, so this was one of the uh, device interrogations which we are trying to do and then we could see these are some of the VT spells as well. The bidirectional VT, as I was already telling, the axis keeps on changing with each and every beat of this. The mechanism, I already said it, now coming to the management, which is the key. As I was telling you about, we should always be a good clinician. Good clinician, why? The good clinician is the one which treats the patient first. We should always try to focus on our patient. We should try to listen to him, what that patient is trying to tell us. And from that story itself, we, we will be able to arrive at a good and really good diagnosis with which we will be able to help. So it also involves good physical examination, a ECG and a possible EP study as well. So as I was telling you about the age, what happens is if those patients are old enough, or older age, uh, more than 35 years, 85% of those wide curious tachycardias will be VT in fact. Similarly, also try to ask them for the symptoms. What are the symptoms did you have when you were having that arrhythmia? If someone is having a history of palpitation, syncope, diaphoresis, especially with associated with angina or even scissors as well, most of the times they are really having a pathological cause which is causing the tachycardia and of course the symptoms as well. And also try to look at the electrolytes. So because a lot of times what will happen is those white curious tachycardia, the underlying pathology can be something like hypokalemia as well and also the associated cardiac diseases. For example, if someone gives a history of um, coronary artery disease, or the patient has had a myocardial infarction. So as I said, most of the times, they will be, of course, having what is called as a ventricular tachycardia. And also try to look out if the patient is having a, a renal failure, and is there any associated family history as well of sudden cardiac death or arrhythmias. And how about those medications? Medication means what medicine that person is taking, in fact, is it a QT prolonging drug, something like a digoxin uh, drug as well, or diuretics, and also the habits. We are determined by our habits. So even about those patients as well, are they taking some, you know, fancy drugs, 
or something else as well, we need to know. And now coming to the physical examination, let's not forget our basics. How about the hemodynamic stability of the patient, in fact? Are there any symptoms of associated congestive heart failure? Otherwise, the stroke or if the patient is having an ICD or the pacemaker, is there any evidence of his AV dissociation? For example, we can also, a lot of times, we can notice what is called as Canon A waves. Otherwise, there is a marked fluctuations in the blood pressure. Are they also, those patients are responding well to the maneuvers. These maneuvers may be very simple, but they make some of the biggest uh, 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 really impact on those diagnosis of those simple arrhythmias. Uh, so let's not always forget our basics as well. There are other tests as well which I already said it. Those uh, blood investigations are there. Get a chest x-ray and of course the echo as well to rule out other uh, structural heart diseases as well. So whenever you we come across a white clear stachycardia, some of the things which we should always try to look for is AV dissociation. So between the A and the V are they coming regular to each other or are they coming irregular to each other? Similarly, fusion beats. Fusion beats, I'm going to show some examples as well. Fusion beats, capture beats, the width of the QRS. And even in the normal sinus rhythm, if you get an ECG, is it showing any evidence of ischemia, acute myocardial infarction, old MI, Brigada pattern, LVH as well. So in this, we can clearly see the AV dissociation, the fusion beats. So these are some of those ECG criteria as well, which is very, very important. And as I said it, if a patient comes to you for the acute management, if the patient is unstable, as I said, it, whenever in doubt, you are not able to distinguish the QRS in the T interval, always go for cardioversion. Don't bother about all those other things as well. Of course, if you can always apply those algorithms, standard algorithms, it's always nice. But and similarly, if the patient is stable, you can use a class 1 or class 3 antiarrhythmic drugs and of course try to treat whatever is the predisposing cause for that ischemia, electrolytes, in fact as well. For the chronic uh, management, you can try to consider the usage of antiarrhythmic drugs. Of course, EPS and RFA as well, I'm going to show you some cases and the ICD as well. He is Hein Valens who started up uh, the modern cardiac electrophysiology, so I was trained at Maastricht, so, I, uh, so the, he's my guru, Dr. Karl Timamons, under whom I did my EP training as well. So this is one example which I treated in Delhi. So this gentleman was having this kind of VPB. So as we can see, this is what is called as a right ventricular outflow tract VPB. I took him for 3D mapping, so these red dots are the ones uh, which is showing the sites of ablation. And after ablation, we can see it clearly achieved complete sinus rhythm. So we can cure those patients. I would say like almost 98 to 99 percent. And the patient need not take any medi medicine at all. This was the case. Oh, oh, it's not coming so well. I'm so sorry. Um, so this is the another case. If you will look carefully at the dates. So this was yesterday. I did it in uh, almost in the noon time. It was a 11 year old boy who even had stopped uh, going for sports and all. Why? Because he used to get tachycardia. So what do we see it over here? So we can see clearly the pre-excitation over here. 11 year old boy, can you imagine? He was not even able to enjoy his childhood. And then, so this is the EC which was taken at around 3.30 in the evening. So before I was trying to rush over here, I took the ECG, so he was doing well. And the pre-excitation is gone. So this guy is not going to need any medicine at all. And he is cured. So I have taken the patient's consent. So this was another really good case. 18 year old girl. 18 year old girl. Earlier she was seen at one of the India's most premier institute. Later on, so she was admitted over there for like 3 to 4 weeks. She was continuing to have tachycardia. And then she came to even another premier institute. Uh, I should not take the name. So which we can see it over here. 18 year old girl. She was having so much of incessant tachycardia. She developed tachycardia myopathy and ejection fraction went down to 25%. And then these medications, what she was taking and all, then I did the first state's first uh, complex 3D ablation in fact. And this was the tachycardia ECG, which she was having in fact. And then I did the ablation and you'll be surprised to see the results. Just three weeks after ablation, so this is how much, so I have already taken the consent as well. So as you can see, this is normal ejection fraction. Within just three weeks, 
this girl has been taking so many medications and all that. And as I said, she even had developed tachycardiomyopathy, in fact. This is the another view of it as well, of that same patient. So this is another patient as well. So this is what is the classical fascicular VT. Why we are calling fascicular VT? These are the things which support. As I was telling you, the capture beats. Those capture beats are pretty narrow compared to the uh, tachycardia beats. We also see what are the other features which is pre pre uh, present over here is avia is pretty prominent over here. There is AV dissociation, so that's why it is a, a VT. We can also see the fusion beats over here. And there is, of course, AV dissociation. So what I did was I went try tried to go retrograde. In fact, for this patient, I could get some good potentials. We were able to induce the tachycardia. I had to use a 3D mapping again for this gentleman as well. So those red spots show those ablation points. And finally, after getting a good spot, we ablated and the, uh, and the patient now is doing arrhythmia free life. And uh, just now, uh, the last few slides, normally in cardiology, we try to say car time is muscle. Even for patients, especially uh, now atrial fibrillation will be spoken by Dr. Ajay Kumar Sinha, sir. Uh, he's a wonderful orator. And just a little insight is time is muscle even in atrial fibrillation. Earlier, you are able to uh, get hold of those patients. You can inter intervene. You can give them a success rate of 80 to 90 percent. 80 to 90 percent. Almost you can cure them, in fact. And uh, I, I also received the NRI of the Year Award from the Times Media Group. Uh, and for academics, because I was pretty amazed, normally these kind of awards are given to the scientists. So I really dedicated this award to all the physicians over here. It was a big feat. Thank you all so much. And uh, so you all will be happy. A lot of these EP products, which is being coming up from those Star Wars in US, they are getting a connection from based at Patna. I'm the one who approves them, in fact. So this is the, some of those products as well for... Uh, supraventricular arrhythmia, especially AF. Dr. Ajay Kumar Sinha will be talking about it. And the best thing I want to announce is I had got this notification just seven months back. 2017 expert consensus document on atrial fibrillation ablation still refers to two of my papers, so which I had published long ago. So this was a really something pleasant surprise for me. So there are a lot of uh, good studies as well, which ensure good ablation success rate in fact. So to summarize, white complex tachycardias include law of arrhythmias. However, taking good history, good physical examination, and diagnosis with the uh, help of simple tools, even uh, including ECG as well, we can manage them very, very well. Thank you so much. I'll be happy to answer any questions.